Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I just returned from Vegas. Maybe my computer is not functioning properly. Turns out the audio was broken. That's good. We got it fixed now. Today, we're going to be discussing three hacks to run deep in multi-table tournaments. Hopefully sound will start working in just a second. If it's there, let me know. Realize that if you want to run deep in small stakes tournaments, you have to have a few tricks and know how to get out of line and exploit your opponents to take advantage of whatever they do incorrectly. What a lot of people think they should do is load up a GTO solver or a GTO trainer, play the GTO trainer all day, learn to play GTO poker, and then do that. And that might be fine and good against some of the best players in the world, but it will leave a ton of money on the table against players who make all sorts of blunders. You must get out of line in order to exploit the mistakes your opponents are going to make. So in this webinar, we're going to be discussing three hacks to help you run deep in those small stakes tournaments. First, we're going to discuss some exploits to help you build a big stack early. Next, we're going to discuss some big mistakes to avoid when playing on the bubble. And we'll also discuss how to handle the pressure of being deep in a tournament when things may not be going your way. Because, hate to break it to you, you're not always going to have a big stack and just absolutely crush your opponents. So, hack number one is to focus on playing pots in position against the weakest players at your table. I see so many players who study game theory optimal ranges like we have in the poker coaching app. And then they use those ranges against the weakest players at the table early in a tournament. And if that is your strategy, I hate to break it to you, you are making huge mistakes because your opponents are not going to play anywhere near the game theory optimal strategy, both pre-flop and post-flop. So logically, what should you do if you think your opponent's going to, let's say, always stack off whenever they get top pair on the flop? What should that do to your pre-flop calling range in position? Well, if they're just going to load their money in with top pair, you should be playing a lot wider in position, especially with hands that can beat top pair, like suited connectors, suited gappers, etc. What should you do if you think your opponent's never going to four bet bluff you? Meaning instead of taking the ace five suiteds and some, um, some marginal hands like Ace Jack offsuit and throw in a four bet every once in a while. What if they never do that? Well, you should three bet a little bit more linearly because they're going to call your three bet with all sorts of marginal hands that should fold. And when they do four bet, well, you can just fold almost everything, right? So let's take a look at a few hands to illustrate this. Here we have seven four suited, normally not such a great hand, but here we are playing 250 big blinds deep. Facing a, we have them tagged as a weak player, but weak in this instance means, um, you know, just not good. Quite often early in the tournament, you may not know what your opponent's doing correctly. Either way, if your opponent is overly weak and passive and they'll check fold too often, this is a great spot to call because they're going to check fold the flop too often. If this is a player who will stack off with top pair every time, this is a great spot to call and try to make two pair or a flush or a straight. So either way, against either of those types of players, oh my God, I almost knocked over this giant cup of water. Uh, I'm getting excited over here. Against either of those types of players, you should be playing this hand by calling. You do not want to three bet because when you three bet, if they're somewhat tight to begin with, they are going to call or four bet and we're going to be in bad shape. So this is the spot where we're just going to call and see the flop. Big blind calls as well. You will note when you do call the button, the big blind's going to call a lot, but that's fine because we have a hand that can make straight seven flushes and two pair. Big blind checks, king seven four. We've got the two pair. Low jack bets. You may say, what if we don't have two pair? Then we'd be in a tough spot. Not really. Call and try to improve. In this scenario, though, especially given the flush draw and straight draw on the flop, even though the straight draw is kind of unlikely for the opponent, we definitely want to put in a raise because if they have a king, they're just going to load money in. If they have a flush draw, they're going to load money in or at least call. So we want to raise kind of big. Notice they go 700. We're not making it 1600 or 2000. We're making it 2500. And if you told me you wanted to go even bigger because you thought this player would only continuation bet the flop with something like, 
a good pair or a good draw, well, then they're probably not going to fold. So you might as well just make it bigger. Something like 3,000 would be fine. They now re-raise to 7,000. What should you do? Well, in GTO world, I imagine we're probably supposed to just call and try to keep them in with all their bluffs. The thing is, though, this player's not bluffing because that's not how weak players operate. Weak players, straightforward players, tight players, whatever, if they re-raise here, you can be very sure that they have... What do you think? Something like ace-king and better? Maybe king-queen and better? Or a high equity draw, and probably not even a high equity draw. So, I think we should just rip it in. Sounds crazy, I know. You may say, what if they have pocket kings or sevens or fours? Well, sevens and fours are really unlikely. And, you know, there's only three combinations of kings, so there's five combinations of hands that beat us at this point. There's six combinations of aces. So right there, if they're not going to fold aces, we can just happily get it in. And then, there's 12 ace kings and maybe some king queens. So... In this spot, we are losing five times out of, what, 23? And I don't think anyone's folding ace-king here. So this is a great, 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 great spot just to rip it in. We do rip it in. They call. They have aces. We win a nice pot. Bottom two pair always loses online. I don't think so. That's not how math works. Making it 3.5x his bet. Let's talk about something here. When the opponent bets small on the flop, your raise should not be in an increment to his bet size. It should be in an increment to the size of the pot. Notice in this spot, if we call, the pot goes up to 2,800, and then we are putting in 1,700 on top. So it's like a two-thirds pot size raise. If the opponent bet bigger, we could make the same two-thirds pot size raise, but it would be to a smaller amount in relation to their bets. What if you want to bet 100, or sorry, 200? What if they bet 200 here? Would you want to raise to 3.5x to 700, right? I mean, that would be ridiculous because then your opponent's getting amazing odds. So you're raising always in relation to the pot, not in relation to the opponent's bet size. And as they bet smaller, typically your bet in relation to their bet size, which is, again, not how you need to think about it, will be much larger. Like if they made it 200 here, I would make it about the same, 2,000 through 2,500, something like that. And like I said, I might even go bigger in this scenario. But yeah, when the opponent makes it 7,000 here, they have announced they love their hand. And if they love their hand, they're not folding. So just rip it in, get paid. And yeah, you're gonna have to fade some outs. They're going to have aces or ace-king a lot. Or maybe some ace high flush draw. So, there you go. Let's take a look at another one. Ace-ten of hearts. Loose, weak player raises. We have ace-ten of hearts in the cutoff. 250 big blinds deep. What should we do? Well, this is an excellent spot to 3-bet. Now, normally, you would want to call this hand because you really don't want a 3-bet and then get 4-bets. But if the opponent's raising too wide to begin with and they're not going to 4-bet often enough, this hand becomes very good to 3-bet because they're going to call with all sorts of weaker ace-x, all sorts of suited, connected hands, maybe even offsuit stuff like Jack-10 offsuit. So this goes from being a spot where calling normally makes a whole lot of sense to a hand that you really want to be 3-betting just straight up for value. And then if they 4-bet, they're usually going to make it huge, and you can just get out of the way. Like, imagine, we do make it 2,000. If it gets back to the opponent, they make it 8,000. Just fold. You're going to be against, like, aces, kings, queens, ace, king, maybe ace, queen. You're super dominated. So, this becomes a very, very good spot to 3-bet. And you can make it a little bit bigger than the 3x because we are very deep stacked. Whenever you are deeper and deeper stacked, you'll find that your 3-bet size should typically get a little bit bigger and bigger because you want to be able to build a pot so that you can stack your opponents when you feel inclined. They do call. Ace, 10, 6. Pretty good flop. They check. Definitely bet. We go 1,800. I could be convinced that bigger is better. I mean, look, in this scenario, hmm, the board is very draw heavy, but we do block their a lot of their obvious continues, Right? 
So I get the idea of betting small in the spot, but if you put me in this scenario, I'd probably go a little bit bigger, like 2,200 or 2,500, something like that, because there's lots of straights and flush draws. That said, whatever, 1,800 is fine. The opponent calls, turns a five, they check. Definitely keep betting, definitely go big. When they check and call the flop bet, they're going to have some sort of made hand or draw. Made hands and draws both have lots of equity here. So we want to bet big. We go for more than the size of the pot. Now, you may say, if you go more than the size of the pot, will that make your opponent fold out some of their top pairs? Well, if they will, then the over pot's pretty terrible, right? If they will not, though, over pot's good. We just want to get as much money in the pot as possible. Okay? Um, I will say that if I was in this scenario, I probably would have just potted it roughly, like 8,000. I think when you start going 10,000, especially if you throw in two 5,000 chips, that may make some people deathly afraid because they realize, oh my God, the big chips are coming out. I better get out of the way. But if your opponent's not thinking like that at all, as many players won't, then yeah, just bet as big as you reasonably can. You may ask, why are we betting so big? Don't we want to get called? Well, the board is incredibly dynamic, meaning there are plenty of draws available that could easily improve to beat our hand at the moment. And on top of that, our hand is almost always the best hand at the moment. Anytime there is a straight and or flush draw on the board, but no straight or flush yet, usually you want to be betting big with your hands that are almost always good, but very vulnerable. That'd be something like ace, queen, and better in this scenario. Because that hand is essentially, well, those hands are essentially always good. So we go 10,000, they go all in. Take a second, think about it. What should we do? What are our bluffs on the turn? I think we can bluff with logical high equity draws. I'm probably not doing a whole lot of bluffing beyond that, just because I don't think a lot of people are folding a t uh, an ace. Would you still three bet over a weak player's raise and cold callers? Um, Yeah, you want to be really linear. To be fair, naturally, you want to be really linear in that spot. I will say, as more and more people enter the pot, especially if you think they're somewhere near reasonable, you just should not get nearly as out of line. But as they are weaker, then yeah, you can certainly three bet wider. Tuned in just in time to hear me say, take a second and think about it. Classic JL. Yes, take a second and think about it. Always take a second and think about it. Does this player have literally only sets? Some people do. A set of fives is pretty unlikely. A set of sixes probably raises the flop, right? Aces and tens is pretty hard to have. So I expect to see a whole lot of 6-5, ace-5. Maybe some draws like 8-7 of clubs. Queen-jack of clubs, stuff like this. So yeah, how do we do against that range? We're crushing it. I'm sure someone in the chat's going to say, every time they have a flush draw, they win. Two pair never wins online. Yes, it does. Call it off. We have the best hand by a mile. A seven of clubs, so we have to fade a flush draw. And we do. Sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes we fade the flush draw. I do agree when the player jams, they are going to have a lot of two pairs, sets, and flush draws. The problem is it's really hard to have a set, given they'll probably check raise a set of sixes on the flop. Fives probably just folds to the flop bet. So like we just have the best hand always, right? So if you just have the best hand always, you can't go around folding even though you will lose some portion of the time. Sometimes you're going to lose. We had to fade some outs. That time, we did. Hack number two. Stop playing so tightly on the bubble. Many recreational players way overvalue cashing in tournaments. And while there certainly are some times where you do need to tighten up and collect the payout, collect the free bubble money, or the free payout money, in most situations, the best players find this time of the tournament, the bubble, to put pressure on the weakest players who overvalue their min cash. A lot of players who get a decently big chip stack on the bubble think, okay, I'm in good shape. I'm just going to hang out and collect my min cash. It's free. What could go wrong? And to be fair, they're going to collect that min cash pretty much every time. But in exchange for collecting that min cash pretty much every time, they're giving up winning the tournament or getting a gigantic stack a whole lot of the time. Let's take a look at an example. Ace-5 offsuit in the hijack, 25 big blinds deep. 
Some big stacks fold over around us. Should we raise this? Cutoff has 38 big blinds. Button has five. Small blind has 15. Big blind has 20. Well, in this spot, we are three off the money. We're not actually in the money yet. And we're not super duper close. I mean, look, it depends on how many people in the field. If, if there's 100 people who get paid, then three off is pretty close. If there's 15 people who get paid, three off is actually kind of far, right? So definitely make sure you realize the scenario you're playing in. If the player in the cutoff likes to battle, well, definitely fold. If you're going to raise this and get three bet a large chunk of the time, then that's just terrible, right? But if your raise is going to get this cutoff player who probably thinks, well, may think, you think they think, that they just need to try to sneak in the money, if that if you're just going to easily make them fold, then you get to play against shorter stacks who should play very tightly. This becomes a great spot to raise because even though we are not the big stack by any means, we kind of get to act like the big stack in this hand. If we min raise and the button goes all in, we can easily call because he only has five big blinds. If we raise and one of the other players go all in, we can easily fold. So this is just an easy spot to fold. On the bubble, as AF Kali says, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. All big stacks are not necessarily going to try to be pushing you around. That's especially true if stacks are set up like they are here where the players who have folded have more chips than us. Because this player with the middle stack, especially in small stakes games where the players are not paying attention to every single individual pot, they may think, okay, I'm the middle stack on the bubble. Middle stacks need to try to get in the money. Therefore, I'm going to play tightly without realizing that once the big stacks fold, the cutoff is the big stack in this hand, right? So they should be acting like the big stack. They should be three betting you and the hijack a lot if you are going to raise far too wide. But a lot of people won't do that. They will instead just think, okay, I'm a middle stack. Play tightly. So this becomes a pretty reasonable spot to raise it up. We raise it up. Big blind calls. King Jack 2. They check. Should we bet? I think this is a pretty reasonable spot to go for a small continuation bet to get all their junk to fold. We do go small. 12 into 44. They call. Okay, turns a seven, they check. Should we keep bluffing? Well, here's where it's important to note, are there a lot of other short stacks in the tournament? If there are a lot of short stacks in the tournament, we are gonna be tripling this off pretty much every time. If there's only this one five big blind stack and then everybody else has 15 or 20 big blinds, we have to be way more cautious because then, the big blind is not under quite as much payout implication pressure, right? You may say, is this even a good bluff hand? Don't you have better bluffs? I mean, look, if you think about it, in spots like this, we want to be betting with perhaps some high equity draws that can bet and call it off. But if you think about it, there aren't really a lot of those. You don't really want to be betting queen, 10 of hearts and then getting jammed. That would be pretty bad. Um, So what? We're betting with some gut shots like queen, nine offsuit. Does ace-10 want to bet? If you bet ace-10 and get jammed, it's pretty bad. Same thing for ace-queen. So I don't think we really want to be betting those so much unless we think we're just never going to get shoved. So I think we want to be betting our kind of junky draws and then just like some really good like ace-high flush draws. So I think this is a pretty good spot to find additional bluffs, at least more than you may think. So additional bluffs are essentially going to be hands with some outs that don't mind betting and folding. And an ace in this spot is a pretty clean out, right? So we can probably get away with betting our very high equity draws and then also some really junky draws. Queen nine, 10 nine, ace high. Seems reasonable to me. And this is a spot where we can over bluff a little bit because notice we do cover the opponent. Even if we do bluff it off and lose, we'll still have four big lines, which is not a ton, but maybe or maybe not we'll be able to sneak into the money. We go for a medium bet, they call. Rivers and eight of spades. They check. Ugh. Do we go for it? So in spots like this, when the flush misses, you really don't want to bluff with your busted flush draws. Because when you have a busted flush draw, it's way more likely your opponent has a made hand. Like a king. When the flush draw misses, and when the straight draw misses... 
it makes it way more likely the opponent is sitting there with a busted flush draw or a busted straight draw when we don't have any of those cards. And notice we don't really block the flush. Well, we don't block the flush, and you know, ace ten and eight, an ace queen are somewhat likely, but not a ton. Um, we really don't want to block the queen and the ten here, right? So this is a really good hand to bluff with. If we get here on the river, I think this is a very, very mandatory bluff. We'll put it all in and we will expect to have a lot of fold equity. They're gonna call the king, but I think they're gonna fold everything else. Now, I will say some players, when they call the turn, have literally a king or a high equity draw. The thing is though, is that there's a lot of high equity draws and they're gonna fold to a shove, right? And on top of that, we lose to some shoves. So this is a spot where we have a very easy all in and this time they let us have it. So you say if you don't have a busted flush draw, bluff. Look, you want, the, look, okay, the best hands to bluff with are hands that either block the nuts, but notice here you can't really block the nuts because what are the nuts? Like a king or a jack, right? You're not bluffing with a king or a jack. So you want to block the nuts or you do not want to block the hands that your opponent will automatically fold. Which hands will the opponent automatically fold? Well, they'll automatically fold ace high of hearts, queen high of hearts. Now look, I realize we beat queen high of hearts, but that doesn't matter so much. This is a spot where if they have the ace high or queen high flush draw or any flush draw, they're just gonna fold, especially doing all in. If they even rivered an eight or somehow have a seven with like seven, six of hearts, they're just gonna fold. On the bubble, you know, they're just not gonna sit here and call it off with literal nothing. <laughs> They're not going to call off with literally nothing on the river when we have so many hands like aces, kings, jacks, ace, king, king, queen, king, jack, etc. Right? So this is a spot where I think we have a very, very, very easy all in. But what do most people do wrong in this hand though? What do most people do wrong? They don't even play it to begin with. Most people in this spot, they just think, all right, I'm a middle stack. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to fold. Without recognizing... The player in the cutoff is often going to be too tight. Now, again, this is very player dependent. This is very player dependent. If the player in the cutoff is going to be loose and splashy and battly, then you should fold, right? This is why, again, you can't just like look at a GTO chart and do what GTO chart says or, you know, ICM adjust the GTO chart. So um, this is something a lot of people do wrong right off the bat. A lot of people on the flop, they're like, oh, bad flop for me. They could have a lot of good stuff here, which, you know, they could, but so could we. They don't go for the small flop bet. On the turn, they think, all right, they called me. They must have something. And yeah. They do. But again, this is a reasonable bluffing hand because I'm not sure we want to be betting stuff like marginal flush draws because if we bet marginal flush draws and get jammed, we have to fold and that's terrible. And um, so we want to be betting like gut shots and ace high. So here we have it, gut shots and ace high. And high equity draws, super high equity draws. And on the river, we don't block the flush draw. So it seems like an easy spot to bet. But this is a spot where I would have bet that a lot of people play every single street differently and they leave a ton of money and opportunity on the table. And yeah, by playing this way, sometimes you do go broke on the bubble. But notice here, when they fold, we get 34 big blinds back in our stack and then we can tangle with the big stacks. We can open a little bit wider perhaps. And then we can, you know, continue to try to run up our stack. Hack number three is to never give up when you get down to a short stack, I'm not going to name this player, but there's this player who had good tournament results. But every time he got down to about 10 big blinds, he would get it all in with like literally any two cards thinking, all right, well, I only have 10 big blinds. We either have to quadruple up or go, go out. And this player was a very good deep stacked player, but a really, really bad short stack player. That player is now broke, despite the fact that they were a big winner 15 years ago. To be fair, a lot of people who were big winners 15 years ago are now broke. But um, they were bad with a short stack. And if you torch your money every time you get short, well, that's not going to work out for you. If you want to go deep in tournaments, you should always believe that you can spin up your short stack because that's often what you are going to need to do in order to win. And I don't mean you should just get in there and gamble hard and try to spin it up. I mean, you should learn how to play good, strong, fundamentally sound short stack poker because I know for a fact a lot of you do not. I've been posting some quizzes on Twitter recently, and some of them are, how do you play with short stacks, for lack of better words? They either play it way too tightly or way too loosely, or they just have big misconceptions. They think, okay, 10 big blinds, I have to go all in or fold. No, you don't. 
Have you studied the charts? Have you looked at good, strong, fundamentally sound poker? Realize that sometimes your 10 big blinds will quickly turn into 50 big blinds if you run hot and pick your spots well. AF Kali said he came back from 2.5 big blinds to get second place yesterday. LOL. Yeah. See this trophy here? You see this trophy? I won it the other day in Las Vegas. This is from a $25,000 buy-in tournament. I don't even, don't even remember how much I won. 450K or something. In this tournament, on the bubble, I lost a giant hand where I had a set. I had full house. I had the bottom full house against a better full house in a spot where it was really, really, really hard for him to have a better full house. On the river, he bet everything except for my last six big blinds. And instead of putting it all in with what I thought was the best hand, like 90% of the time, I called on the off chance that my opponent did have the random full house. You know what they had? They had the random full house. And I was down to six big blinds. And from there, I spun it up. I won some hands. I don't even remember what hands I won. Whatever. You got it all in. You won some hands, right? And my six turned into, eventually, all of the chips. And I won the tournament. It happens. Actually, you can't see it back here. This tournament at Mirage that I won. At the very end of day one. At the very end of day one. I got all my money in with ace-king against tens. And I lost. Except I had six big blinds. I almost didn't even show up for day two because it was a Sunday and I wanted to play online poker. But I showed up for day two thinking, all right, I'm going to rip it in, give it a spin. And I want all my all-ins. Then I want a million bucks. You don't remember winning 450K? I honestly don't remember how much money I win when I play poker because it just goes right into an account. <laughs> Vegas is great. You can literally not touch a dollar the entire time you're there except for tipping money. Like I don't deal with any cash when I go there. I, I wire in the money. It goes straight to the poker cage. I show up, sign a document. They give me chips. I win the tournament. I sign a document. It goes to the account. It gets wired back home. Nice and easy. So yeah, I actually have no clue much I want on that tournament. You can look it up. There's a nifty website called the Global Poker Index. You can search GPI Jonathan Little or any poker player. It'll give you all sorts of stats. So how do you pick your spots well? You have to learn how to play good, strong, short stacked poker. Let's take a look at two very common spots. Here we have. 10 big blind pre-flop strategy, okay? Here's the button raise first in range. The dark red hands are going all in. The light red hands are min raising. You may say, what? Min raising off of 10 big blinds? Well, yes, indeed. Notice something like pocket jacks and better. Aces, kings, queens, and jacks likes to min raise a lot. And then a few sporadic bluffs like queen five suited, 10 six suited, queen nine offsuit, king eight offsuit. King seven offsuit, jack nine offsuit, king 10 suited. You'll call off an all in against that though. And you may say, are you really bluffing with any of those hands? And the answer is absolutely yes. You need to know these charts. You need to study these charts very well because by playing this way, as opposed to all in or fold, you get to play a few extra hands profitably. All these hands that are on the cusp that are mostly folding or raising or you know mixing folds and raises, these are not really profitable to go all in. But by min raising your absolute nuts, you get to min raise a few bluffs. And that allows you to play a few more hands profitably than people who think poker is all in or fold when they get down to 10 big blinds. Okay? Let's take a look at this chart here. 10 big blind, small blind raise for sin strategy. So here, everyone folds to you in the small blind. What should you do? Well, the hands in green limp and the hands in red go all in. Notice all these hands in green that are on the cusp of playability. Now, you certainly could just open shove some of them if you felt inclined, if you were using a shove or fold only strategy. But notice you get to play far more hands if you use a limping strategy. And by playing more hands profitably, you make more money in this spot than people who only go all in or fold. What a lot of people do wrong here is they don't limp stuff in this region. The, you know, queen 10 suited, jack nine suited, 10 nine suited. And then if they get shoved on, they fold it. Don't do that. These hands are good enough. All these hands up here are limping and then calling an all-in. All these hands down here, 10, two suited, eight, two suited, nine, six offsuit, jack, four offsuit, et cetera. These are bad. These are going to limp and then fold if your opponent goes all-in. Also notice the pretty wide all-in range, right? A lot of people don't go all-in with all these hands. They limp it. They do something like 
raising, who knows what they do. But this is a spot where using this strategy is gonna make you way more money than an all in or fold strategy or a limp only strategy or just a raise, raise or fold strategy, whatever. Using your options is very, very valuable. Just because you're shallow does not mean that you should be going all in or folding with any hand you want to play. So those are three hacks to run deep in tournaments. Number one, exploit the weak players by playing in position against them. Number two, stop playing so tightly on the bubble. And number three, never give up on your short stack. And if you focus on these three things, you will run deep in tournaments far more often. See some of you are asking random questions over here. I'll answer, I'll answer those in a bit. But first though, I have an exciting announcement to share with all of you. We have a brand new coach at pokercoaching.com. You know who it is? He's my oldest friend from poker. I went on my very first poker trip with him to Vienna, Austria, back when I was, I think I was 20. It is my Uncle Shannon Shore. He is our newest poker coaching coach. He is a veteran of poker, over $13 million in live tournament earnings, and he has a ton of knowledge to share with all of you. Here's him winning one of these cups. Look at that. He's kicking things off with a brand new series on how to crush every stage of a poker tournament. I learned a lot in this series, and I'm sure you will too. You cannot buy this series, though. It is not for sale. As with a lot of the content at PokerCoaching.com, the only way to get access to it is to become a Poker Coaching Premium member. Unfortunately for you, you can buy two months and get one free right now during the spring sale. Check it out at PokerCoaching.com slash spring. You will get full access to my Uncle Shannon Shore's brand new coach, brand new coach, brand new course on how to crush every stage of a tournament. Here's the course, dominating the early stages, deep stack tips for the early stages, crushing the middle stages, navigating the bubble and understanding ICM, how to play by commanding the late stages of a tournament and crushing the final few tables and going for the win. You can get full access to this right now at pokercoaching.com slash spring. Also, if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you get full access to my tournament masterclass. This is a 40 hour long course. This is not a course like on a lot of other poker sites where it's a bunch of hour and a half long videos with no explanations about anything. This is broken down into a ton of 10 minute or shorter videos with a quiz after each. That way you have short bite-sized pieces of information you can consume and then test yourself so that you are sure you are fully learning the information so that you can get in there and implement it. This is not a put this on at nighttime, have a beer and pass out on the couch type of website. I want you to get in there and engage and study. We also have our advanced tournament course featuring some of the absolute crushers. We have Brock Wilson, Jonathan Jaffe, myself, Justin Saliba, Matt Affleck, and Rampage Poker. He's learning. He's doing his best. But once you go through the tournament masterclass, the advanced tournament course is for you. We also have a brand new series called The Hero's Journey featuring myself and Slick Rick. He decided a few months ago he really wanted to devote his life to poker. He sent me an email, said, will you coach me? I like this story. I read every support email that comes through, by the way. I said, sure. I said, I will coach you for an hour every week when our schedules line up for a year. If you devote yourself to poker and we will see how it goes. So far, over the first few months, he's up about... 80,000 bucks in cash games. He won a World Series circuit ring. He almost won another one. He is absolutely smashing it. And you can go through all of our private coaching sessions on pokercoaching.com in the hero's journey. We have a ton of other content, including how Giraffe Ganger won $2.8 million in what I think is the biggest online poker tournament ever. He won it from his barn. Congrats to him. We have crushing high stakes poker with Brock Wilson. He is a super genius. He gets in there and wins. We also have how to run deep in large field tournaments on season two featuring Aram Zobian and how to bink with Brock and Rampage. We're doing our best to make Rampage good at poker. He tries his best. He loves to bluff so much, but we're getting in there and we are doing our best to coach him. Notice we've only discussed tournament content in this video. We have a lot of cash game content too, though. We're not going to discuss it. If you like uh, cash game content, 
We have a ton on PokerCoaching.com featuring many of the absolute best players in the world. So make sure you check that out. Also, if you join right now at PokerCoaching.com slash spring, you will get a free subscription to PokerGo. I love watching the content on PokerGo. It's fun. It's engaging. It's entertaining. And you can learn a lot. You can also watch myself and all the poker coaching coaches battling it out on a regular basis in the Poker Go studio. I'm actually going to be there in April playing their next tournament series. You can go back and watch my two wins from the last uh, the last series, the Poker Go Cup. So make sure you do that. If you sign up right now at pokercoaching.com slash spring, you get a free subscription to that. So check it out right now at pokercoaching.com slash splash slash spring to get one month for free when you buy two is lexi gavin mather's new book good for tournaments it is make sure you check it out for the timby blind stack isn't it usually better to shove a hand that you would limp and call with because of some fold equity nope follow the charts you had a final two tables world series circuit 13 left you have 630K, blinds 40, 40, 20. So 20, 40. Under the gun, raises to 110. You have queens. You shove. He calls with ace nine. Easy all in. What's the problem? If you buy a membership, how many live sessions per month? Uh, we have a content calendar in pokercoaching.com featuring the upcoming webinars. I'm not sure exactly what we have scheduled, but I do some live content each month. I know Tristan Wade does as well. A few other coaches get in there and make live content. Some of the, a lot of the content's recorded, though, to be fair, because I realize I got to work around coaches' schedules, especially a few of them who live overseas, like Draft Ganger. So check it out. There's co new content uploaded all the time. Can you make a fast fold cash game strategy? Play good, strong GTO poker and adjust logically. But we do have some cash game content on the site. Uh, check it out. We have a lot of content by Brad Wilson. He gets in there and battles online against very tough players. And, you know, he has some smaller stakes content as well. So make sure you check it out. How do you play a lot when you have to work and wake up early every day? You got to make time when you can. Nights and weekends are going to be your friend, I suppose. Maybe weekends. To be fair, look, if you work five days a week, you get two days off. I realize you can only play so much in a day, but I mean, two 14-hour days seems reasonable to me if you really, really, really want to devote your life to poker especially if you don't have any other free time. Also, you can spend a lot of time during the week studying whenever you don't have so much time to actually go play. That way, whenever you do go to play, you're ready. Poker coaching has changed your game big time. Glad to hear it, Sam. That's exactly what we're going for. Worth every penny for anyone wondering. I want to make you a really good deal. If you do not like pokercoaching.com after you sign up, send me an email at support at pokercoaching.com. I'll give you a refund. I'll give you all of your money back if you do not like it. Because if I do not help you improve your poker skills, if you do not like the content, I have done a poor job and I do not want or deserve your money. How about that? Anybody playing the circuit event in Calgary in May? I do not know. Hershey says you're John Little Train. Great. Glad to hear it. Hope you're crushing it. When does the sale end? Go to pokercoaching.com slash spring. I think it says that. Jonathan Jaffe does a great job on cash and tournament content. Yeah, look, Jonathan Jaffe is, as far as I know, a ghost on social media. He does not really put himself out there. But I've known Jonathan Jaffe for a long time. I actually beat him heads up for the second time I won a million dollars. One of those trophies buried back there. It looks like a globe. I beat him heads up. He's a very cool guy to play with, a very cool guy to interact with. And we became friends. He has a good attitude. A lot of people who lose to you heads up for a $500,000 difference may not have a good attitude after it. And to be fair, when I was a young, stupid kid, maybe I wouldn't have, who knows? But Jonathan Jaffe is a cool guy, has a great attitude, he's fun, he's engaging, and um, I think he's probably the best poker player in the world, or at least way up there in terms of best poker players in the world. And he's happy to help at pokercoaching.com. I mean, you just saw him playing the Triton tournaments in South Korea. He made some number of final tables, and he was wearing the poker coaching hat, getting in there, battling hard, and, you know, that's good. That's what we're going for. He has amazing content, both on cash games and tournaments. I watch every single thing that he puts out because I think he's amazing. He played 4,000 hands of cash online on Sunday and lost nine buy-ins. Played your normal game, which usually wins. Is this normal for online? Nine buy-ins is not all that much if you are playing 
relatively high variance games with a relatively low win rate, which is often what you'll be looking at when you're playing online. So uh, yeah, I would say that, that ha- I mean, it happens. It happens. Nine binds is not a lot. If you play 4,000 hands, nine binds is normal. I would ask if like, did you play a session that was overly long? Maybe you were fatigued towards the end. Were you playing too many tables? Were these fast fold games where you know the, game, the, the edge should be small to begin with? There's a lot of reasons why you could have a random downswing, but look, nine binds is nothing. Uh, let's see. You're looking forward to getting back to studying. Will we do a meet and greet with the students this year at the World Series? Almost certainly. For the last few years of the World Series, I bought poker coaching members breakfast who were there. It's been a lot of fun. I think last year we had two breakfasts, and the year before we had two breakfasts. I'm always happy to do that. It's good to hang out, meet each other, and have fun before a tournament. What's worse, going all in preflop a lot or folding a lot? Both are bad. Learn to play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. Your implementable strategy is good for helping understanding ranges and combos. Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you can observe as much content on poker theory and strategy as you want, but being able to implement it is vitally important, especially if you don't have a good, strong framework in place yet for why you should do what you should do in most common spots. You're just going to be guessing. Even if you watch a lot of the best players discuss their thought processes for Random hands, which is like what a lot of content is on the internet, you're not going to have a good framework. And in the tournament and cash game masterclasses at pokercoaching.com, we give you a good, strong framework so that you will know how to make the best or second best play in all the common scenarios that you will likely be in. You're in the big blind with two big blinds stack on the stone bubble. You get to look down at aces. There's a shove and an overshove and two calls before it's your turn. Should you call or fold? You should fold and get in the money for free. Annoying, but yes. If you're ever in that spot, it's probably not a real spot. When you win a tournament, what's your favorite thing to eat after? I usually um, have the bad food after I lose a tournament. Whenever I lose a tournament, if uh, I feel especially gluttonous, I will have spaghetti and cheesecake and Cabernet. After I win a tournament, I usually go to sleep because I'm usually tired. Three to three in the last three days, final tabling. Nice work, all because of poker coaching. Well, because of you and your good work. I'm glad to hear it. Completely change your game and outlook. That is exactly what we're going for. All right, that's me for today. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Hope you enjoyed the three hacks. And I hope if you sign up to pokercoaching.com slash spring, you enjoy Shannon Shore's brand new series, How to Crush Every Stage of the Tournament. What I want all of you poker coaching members to do, actually, is go there and watch it and send me an email with feedback. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. We're always trying to improve for all of you. And I'm always trying to hire the absolute best players in the world who I know have good poker minds that can teach things to help you improve your poker skills. So that's that. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Again, you can get two months. Well, buy two months, get one for free in the spring sale right now at pokercoaching.com spring. Thanks for being here. Good luck. I'll talk to you next time.